fight for the Iron Kingdoms as a Warcaster. Take control of the Mighty Jacks, Arcane Devices, and Dark Sorceries to bring the fight to the War Machine Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. Progress comes to a world of magic as science and the arcane combine to make marvels. Meet steampunk inventors and orc mystics at the Volsun Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. Hi everybody, welcome back to What's in the Box. Today, John, what are we looking at? We're looking at a teeny tiny British tank for uh, bolt action. Okay, I have a problem. Yes. This is What's in the Box. This has no box. It has a bag. <laughs> we have a bag. We have a tank o bag. <laughs> it's a bag o tank. Give it a bag o tank. Have the bag o tank. All right. So, Tetrarch. Yes. British vehicle. British vehicle. Early war, I'm guessing, because it's teeny weeny. Do you know, I can't honestly remember when it was developed, but it was a terrible idea. <laughs> so David <laughs> Fletcher says, anyway. All right, let's have a look at the components. So, it has one teeny tiny hull. We, one teeny tiny hull with a slab-sided front, a bit of a slope there, yep. but plenty of places the shell could just get trapped and just bury into it. Yeah, pretty much. So deflection, not really the De best for this vehicle. De deflection, negligible. Armor thickness, negligible. <laughs> and we'll get to why in a minute. All right, well, we have the turret. Which goes on top. Teeny weeny little turret. Teeny weeny turret. Now, where are the hatches? Uh, well, the whole top is essentially the hatch. All oh, right. This, this whole back, this raised panel here, I think that's the hatch. Okay. So finally, a British vehicle that didn't have a crappy tiny hatch. Yeah, considering the vehicles that came after it still had small hatch syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you get the tracks. This does not look like it has the best suspension. The, the teeny tiny tracks. Teeny tiny tracks with not much suspension. Yeah. It's a, I think it's actually a Christie suspension tank, it? so it's not going to be that bad of a drive, mm. um, but still. <laughs> it has four four big wheels, so... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just having a look to see if I can actually figure out where the drive sprocket should be, the front or the back. Does it even... It doesn't have a drive sprocket, it has a drive wheel. Yeah. Because it's a teeny tiny tank and it's light, I'm guessing. Yes. Uh, the drive wheel uh, should be at the back. So like so? Yeah, because the Brits loved, loved oh, no. putting their, their engine, gearbox, transmission all at the back of a vehicle. Really? Where many designers said that's where it should be. And subsequently, <laughs> history has taught them, yes, that's where it should be. <laughs> Except for the Merkava, which is weird. The Merkava's a clever vehicle. It's weird. All right. <laughs> so anyway, this should go on, I believe, like so. Yeah. Because there's the front, there's the back, and that's the one of these things that's not like the other, so I'm assuming that's a drive wheel. Yeah, most likely. Um, and that's how you tell a Christie tank as well, a Christie suspension tank. There's that big gap between the top uh, running boards and the top of the track because they have a huge amount of movement. Travel. Yeah. Ah, oh, I see. I see. So this thing probably would be pretty good off road. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have one metal sprue here as well with yeah. some of the other components. A little bit of flash to take off these, but mm -hmm. nothing we can't handle. No. Uh, so what do we have on these components? That have guns. Know? Which gun should go on it? Any uh, of the guns? Any All of, of the guns? Any of the guns, really. Um, I think it's a mixture of, I think there's the... Is that a three-inch howitzer in there? And then there's, yeah, the bottom one is uh -huh. a three-inch howitzer. And then those two are basically the same gun, except one of them has a, a, a muzzle end on it, which mm. increases the speed of the, of the shell by increasing the pressure in the barrel. Well, here, let me take a second. I'll tear off some of this flash yep. just to let us see it a little bit better. If I do that, I can't remember what the device is called, but apparently it worked. And I think the most terrible thing you can do is increase the pressure in a gun barrel by restricting the, the gas getting out of it. I think that's a recipe for explosions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, because you can't actually blow up a barrel very easily. If you restrict it enough, oh yeah, that's, that's going to banana. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mythbusters have busted that one. They took a shotgun. Welded the end shut, and the weld broke before the actual gun actually blew up itself. Yeah, but you're working with civilian welds on tempered steel, which is for a shotgun, which hasn't got a very high pressure anyway. And then you play with something like a cannon. And if you stick a dent in a cannon, there is something wrong with it. It is going to go... Okay. There's, there's plenty of pictures of cannons that have went wrong and they've just split in pieces. Okay, so this is what we're talking about with this. Yeah, this, this extended bit on the barrel. Yeah, it looks like it tapers down a lot. Mm -hmm. 
So what, was the shell smaller or...? I think so, I'm not too sure. I've, I've a feeling it just added a little bit of length to the barrel to the, the point where it just restricted it and gave it a bit longer time okay. to build up. And I'm seeing a little bit more of a, a, mach a machine gun is this yeah, here? Yeah, that's a coaxial machine gun for beside the main gun on the turret. Got it. Alright, uh, well this should be a pretty quick build, John. Yes. Uh, so I think we'll take a moment, step away, let John build it, and then we'll quiz him about the history. Hi everybody, we are back and John has our Tetrarch built. So yes. let's uh, let's get a look at it here. It's a teeny tiny tank. It, <laughs> ah, but it's not a tankette, it's just a teeny tiny tank. It's just a teeny tiny tank. It's not as teeny as is required to be a tankette. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's the thing, how small could some tanks get? I mean, like, what, what size would this be to an infantryman? Um, would it be the size of a modern day saloon? I think Tetrarchs are only about four or five foot tall. Okay. Like, the... the it, it is that. I've stood beside one in Bovington and it, it is not much. All right, and what is it, like a two, three-man crew? It's a two-man crew, I believe, yeah. Okay. Um, the commander gets to do all the fun stuff in the turret. <laughs> <laughs> he, he gets to command the tank. Mm. If he's a troop leader, command the troop. Yeah. Uh, load the gun, fire gets, the gun, lay the shots. He gets to aim, load, fire the main gun. He gets to aim, load, fire, unjam, reload, fire the machine gun. <laughs> All while telling the driver what to do. And the driver sat there going, do you want a hand up there? And he's like, no. <laughs> I'm having too much fun I, here. I, I really don't think the driver's going to sit there and go, do you want a hand up there? Trying to get from the driver's position in this up into a moving turret. Yeah. I mean, well, this, it's, this it's, is the thing I find so dangerous about tanks. Is a lot of turret baskets have essentially a hole in them where you can get in. Yeah. Or they have the turret basket open. Which in case you have like swinging arms and shit. Yeah. So and I expect someone to lose an arm. Yeah, that, that's where the mystical uh, turret monster comes from. Right. Uh, where, you know, that one little piece of equipment that you absolutely need, whether it be that pen, mm -hmm. whether it be your coffee mug, whether it be anything else like, hey, that ration bar I started eating half an hour ago and I'm feeling a little peckish. Well, the turret monster will quite happily snag that from you and, like, you will lose it forever until the unlucky Remy crew come along, pull the turret off and go, Someone wasted a perfectly good ration bar down there, <laughs> <laughs> or a Yorkie bar, because they used to come in those boxes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we'll just we'll just uh, look at this Yorkie bar that is now being covered in three years of grease and oil. <laughs> <laughs> now, I haven't said the most ridiculous thing about this tank. All right, what is the most ridiculous thing about this tank? This tank is not designed to go into battle with every other tank in the army. What do you mean? This tank is meant to support airborne landing troops. Let that sink in. Hi. Right. There was, there was an idea at the start of the, the war, like early war period, where they were working on their airborne forces. And they thought, airborne infantry is great. Parachute infantry is fantastic. And we can stick them in gliders. And the gliders will go down. They'll be a lot safer because they will land in a proper kind of plane. Ish. And ish. ish. It worked out pretty well in the end, I think, arguably. And... What they were thinking while they were designing all this stuff and going, wow, horseshoe gliders are so cool. They work really well. They're big. They're impressive. They're stable in the air. The pilots love them, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a gigant, though. It's not a gigant. Jeez, no, it's not a gigant. Um, but the, simultaneously, the Americans, the British, and to an extent the Russians all, all came up with the same idea at the same time. Why don't we give them armor support? Why don't we give these parachute infantry and glider born infantry armor support. Okay, is this where one of my favorite crazy ideas of the war came from? The yeah. rocket parachute? Well, no, no. The rocket parachute was a whole other thing. Okay. <laughs> it was a whole Sorry, other thing. I imagine thing. that this would probably be the ideal thing to stick onto one of those. No, they decided, uh, the, Americans, the Americans and the British both decided, hey, let's make a tank that fits in a glider that then lands with the, the airborne infantry. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So... Already you're stuck with a problem. The, the lifting capacity of a glider isn't much, yeah. so it needs to be light. Right. Um, because what was it made out of? It's still made out of steel. Okay, so it's not like an aluminium tank? No. No, jeez, no. That didn't come until after... That didn't come until around after Korea. Okay, fair enough. Uh, that's I, just, I just I wanted to make sure they weren't going out in a, you know, a Coke can. Yeah, that's when the Americans and British decided, hey, aluminium's a really good thing to make armour from. Go figure. Anyway, back to this. <laughs> back to this. 
So they decided, like, obviously, because it has to go in the glider, it has to be small. Because we, can't, light. we yeah. can't make a glider that will just take a regular tank. We can't just stick a Cromwell or a Sherman into a glider and expect it to work. Yeah. The Germans thought differently. <laughs> With the Gigant. The look up the Gigant. Um, we talked about the Gigant, actually, we have, in we the have. Horsha glider um, unboxing. So the tank is now light. The tank has got little armor because it needs to be light. Mm -hmm. It's also small because it needs to fit in a glider that already exists. Right. Well, what have we made? We've made a small tin box that has a very puny two-pounder gun. Question. Yes. If this was dropped mm -hmm. and the Germans had a emplaced position with just like machine gun nests and stuff, no real anti-tank to speak of, would this cause them a problem? It would cause them a problem, yeah. And Could this shrug off uh, an MG42? For a while. For a while. Probably for a while, because when a bullet hits something mm. that isn't face-hardened, it tends to start eating into it. It makes plastic, what's it called? Pla plastic deformation. Okay. And it starts to push the metal aside as the bullets are trying to get through it. You hit that place enough times, it will eventually fail. Okay. You know, through metal fatigue, vibration, impact, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Plates will shatter, bend, eventually break. Um, so the Tetrarch really, it was a, it was a nice idea. Mm. But um, I've seen the one they have in Bovington Tank Museum, and I actually nearly laughed when I seen it. Really? Because they had it, they have it sat in the remains of a glider carcass. Oh. And you, you sort of walk past, you go, why have they got a piece of a glider in here? And then you see this thing poking out from behind a bit of wood, and you're like, <laughs> oh, you dead truck. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, David Fletcher, who is my god on earth, um, basically said the best thing about Tetrarch, and the best thing about this whole idea of Tetrarch and airborne tanks. it was never deployed? No. It says the best idea behind it was that it would put tanks where the enemy wasn't expecting them. Right. So say, for example, on D-Day, the fellas that landed at Pegasus Bridge, mm. and they brought a couple of Tetrarchs with them. Yeah. The Germans would go, why do we hear tanks? Why have they, how have they got tanks with them? And there would have been a moment of panic. <sighs> and as David Fletcher then goes on to say, had they realised what was behind them, they wouldn't have been that concerned. <laughs> <laughs> because nearly anywhere you'd have landed infantry would have had some sort of anti-tank capability there anyway. Yeah. Look, this is the thing. During World War II, some very funky but clever ideas did come out mm. of the War Department. So, Tetrarch, um, I'm going to give it maybe a three on the funky rating. Yeah, it doesn't beat... Um, what's the other crazy British stuff? Well, on D-Day, they had... Basically, mannequins being dropped with firecrackers with parachutes. Yes, so you had they, that. they would actually land around the Germans. The Germans would hear the firecrackers going off and think, that's gunfire. In the distance, it sounds exactly like gunfire. Yeah. And it, it worked really well. You, I've been reading a lot of Max Hastings' books on it, and he mentions it in one of his chapters, mm. that part of D-Day. Yeah. And he's like, I couldn't believe how many German regiments were deployed to these areas to find that th this entire field of paratroopers was actually... 200 dummies with firecrackers and one commando was just sat there with a Bren gun going ha, 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 I'm just making noise you know, and they'd get captured and said I was just there to make noise and they'd be as smug as anything but yeah well I suppose you know one guy and a bunch of mannequins holds up maybe what 200 guys yeah and you take an entire regiment out of action for two hours just mm. trying to find all these little badly sewn together dummies on tiny parachutes yeah it's great but the the, the airborne tank idea the airborne tank idea is a lovely cookie thing to look into. Mm. Um, the British went with Tetrarch. The Americans went with um, Locust. Locust? Locust, M22 Locust. Okay, I'm going to have to look that up. It, it is cute as sin. It, it actually looks like a little baby Sherman. Um, <laughs> really? It's, it's got nicely cast pieces on it. Like right. the driver's cupola looks like one straight... Uh, the driver's hatch looks like straight one off a Sherman. <laughs> and again, it's got a crap gun. It's tiny. It's totally useless. Um, but it's fun. Mm. And the Russians did try this as well. <laughs> the Russians really tried. Did they not just actually stick like wings on a tank? They tried to just stick wings on a tank and then tow it into the sky, forgetting that an aircraft's takeoff speed is probably a lot faster than what the gearbox gearing and track rating is on the tank <laughs> that it's trying to take off with. <laughs> and there was one, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was one that was trying to figure out... Um, if you parachute drop tanks, you know, if you have a plane that's big enough and just push a tank out the back of it with a parachute on it, or uh, what was the other one? Water landings or stuff like that, or trying to just drop stuff out of 
air, like low flying aircraft and just push a tank out the back okay. ramp of something. Here's your problem: the amount of force versus it. If it has time to hit terminal velocity, yes or no? Yeah. Because as soon as you hit terminal velocity, if you hit water, you may as well smack concrete. Yeah. And one of these one of these Russian experiments, the the designer of this particular vehicle in this particular experiment was yeah. so confident he put his son in the tank uh, and dropped it from thirty feet. Dropped it from thirty feet. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for the end. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding my breath in horror here. Yeah, the the tank went. Obviously, wheels, tracks, everything just went friggin' everywhere because the tank suddenly takes a big shock like that, as if to say, "I've just exploded." Yeah. Um. The the child the craps itself. The, the kid was brought out and had uh, impacted spine problems ever since. So like he shrunk, uh, like he got his whole spine compressed because yeah. of that. Yeah. Um. Not fun. So that was the end of the Russians' development of it. Yeah. Now to bring us from back. to bring us back to this, and then bring us forward to where we are today. Okay. Why can we parachute tanks today? Absolutely, we can. The idea, as primitive and as simple as it was in World War Two, actually mm. became a fairly viable option, particularly by the Russians. Okay. The Russians have been known to airland the likes of BMP threes, mm. some of their larger like eight wheel vehicles, and a few smaller. Uh, track vehicles as well, they do have a lot of research into it and it works pretty well. We have tanks that are designed to be air transported very easily, mm. not air landed very easily. Mm. Like we have Scorpion Scimitar, the CVRT range is all pretty good for that. Yeah. Um, the Americans had a few designs, the Sheridan that you've seen recently in the States. Uh, Sheridan? The, the, which one was it? The American tank you've seen at the first division. I'm trying mm -hmm. to remember which one. I saw a lot of tanks there. It's the one with the really stubby gun. Ah, yeah. Yeah, the Sheridan. Yeah. That was a, uh, put it in the back of a plane, we can fly it out very uh, easily, sort of thing. I see. I think, actually, my favourite one that I saw there had to be Abrams. I'm amazed at how short it is. They are. They are. It's, it's, They're it's stumpy. Modern tanks are very squat. Yeah. And people expect modern tanks to be, like, bigger, bulkier, heavier, scarier uh, looking. I mean, like, footprint-wise, not a problem. Oh, it yeah. looks right. Yeah. Height-wise, it looks as if someone's just, you know, so almost took the video and just went. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the airborne tank not so good in World War Two, but we developed it to the mm. point where it was actually became viable. Right. And Tetrarch probably one of the the granddaddies of that. Important question: mm. Would you use it in a game of bolt action if you had the proper scenario? I would do a what if scenario. Mm. I would actually play out Pegasus Bridge with one or two of these with the the British airborne force with sort of historically accurate side on the German side. Yeah. And then this with a little bit of a what if spin into it. Yeah. Interesting. So if you played it as a historical thing and then said, but what if they had tetrarchs? You just put a couple of tetrarchs into the list with them. Yeah. It could be interesting or you could find that that one German with a Panzerfaust just, just, went, just negates it anyway. Mm. And bear in mind that there was anti-tank emplacements yeah. at Pegasus Bridge. There was a 50 millimeter there and that would have dealt with this thing like it wasn't even there to start with. Fair enough. So. All right, well, uh, everybody, I'll tell you what, get your comments in below. Tell us what games would you play the Tetrarch in. Myself and John will move on here. We'll see you in the next one. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now, and be sure to check out beastsofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming Let's Plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe, and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.